third reading comes from the Gospel according to Luke, verses 13 through 20. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 13. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace on those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all of these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Please pray with me. <clears throat> Gracious Lord, we thank you uh, for this evening, for the song, for the scriptures, for the times of prayer. Lord, our hope is that you would come near to us this evening, just as you came near to us that first Christmas and the arrival of Jesus, our Emmanuel. Lord, my prayer is that I would decrease and that you would increase. Get me out of the way so that your words will come through me, your words of hope, your words of peace and comfort, maybe even your words of challenge. Your words challenging us all to grow in the image and likeness of Jesus Christ, our Emmanuel, our God with us. So Lord, with that, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be found loving and acceptable to you. You, Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Without a doubt, one of the most difficult parts, one of the most stressful parts about the Christmas season is gift giving. Who do I buy from? How much money do I have to spend? And of course, the, maybe the most difficult question, what am I going to get? But we have songs about this, don't we? Let's see if we can finish these lines. All I want for Christmas is my <laughs> tea. That's right. I want a hippopotamus for <laughs> Only a hippopotamus will do. <laughs> and of course, a child, a child, shivers in the cold. Let us bring in silver gold. Tim Hawkins is a Christian comedian, and he has a bit about this song, Do You Hear What I Hear? And he says that Christmas is a little bit bittersweet for him. You see, the first time he performed, it was in a Christmas passion at church, and he had one line in this song, and he screwed it up. And this is, this is what he said. He said, a child, a child, sleeping in the night with a tail as big as a cow. <laughs> That's not how the song goes. <laughs> People don't like it, but if you give baby Jesus a tail, right? <laughs> he says that there's lots of odd things about this song. Think about it. Said the little lamb to the shepherd boy. <laughs> I, I think the shepherd boy's been in the field a little bit too long, don't you? <laughs> Man! Really? <laughs> we gotta go tell the mighty king. And of course, there's a line that we, we just said, right? A child, a child, shivers in the cold. Let us bring him silver and gold. He's shivering in the cold. What open about a nice warm blanket? Or maybe a cup of soup. The kid may have a pneumonia, but at least he's loaded, right? <laughs> Who here has ever received an impractical Christmas gift? Am I the only one? How about a disappointing Christmas gift? <coughs> Whenever I think about disappointing Christmas gifts, I think about Clark W. Griswold <laughs> and Christmas Vacation. The entire movie, he's stressed out and anxious because he has, for his family, wanted to buy a swimming pool. He had to put a huge down payment on it, so much so that he didn't have enough money to cover uh, the down payment, he was banking on a bonus check from his uh, from his work. And when it finally comes, he looks at it, and the family say, "What is it? Is it more than you expected?" He said, "No, it's it's a one year subscription to the Jelly of the Month Club." 
To which Eddie says, Clark, that's the gift that keeps on giving all year round. Yes, it is, Edward. Yes, it is. He says that he's, he begins to freak out because of his huge disappointment. This evening, we're finishing our series entitled Because of Bethlehem. And as the title of the sermon might suggest, because of Bethlehem, we have an opportunity to receive not a disappointing gift, not an impractical gift, but the greatest gift ever. This is indicated by the angel. When the angel announces the arrival of Jesus, he says, I have brought you good news that will cause great joy for all people. But what is this good news? Is it, is, it, is it an instantaneous end to all hunger and disease? Is it instant world peace? No, it's, it's the arrival of a baby, an infant. And, and really, as we read, we don't get a whole lot of long description as to why this is such great news. But you know what we are given? We're given three titles for this baby. Three things that this baby will be known for. The titles are that this baby will be known as the Savior, as the Messiah, and as the Lord. Because of Bethlehem, we can receive and abide with the greatest gift ever given. So how is it that Jesus, in His coming, is the greatest gift humanity has received? What is it about Jesus that causes Him to be the greatest gift? And finally, why? Why is it that Jesus is the greatest gift that we can receive, not just during Christmas time, but all year round? As we consider the how, the what, and the why of Jesus being the greatest gift, the answers to our questions are going to begin with the letter S, just to help with memory. So, how is it that Jesus is the greatest gift that we can receive? There's a lot of reasons why we give and receive gifts, aren't there? One of the healthy reasons is that we love giving and receiving tokens of appreciation and affection with other people. But one of the, the darker, one of the less healthy motivations is, is holding out a false hope. Holding out the false hope that if we get that right gift, if we get that right car, that promotion, that right romantic love interest, then all the darkness and coldness in our life will go away. Everything will be okay if we just get that right gift. And, and sometimes the disappointments in our lives, they're, they're far more serious than just not getting what we wanted for Christmas, right? They bear names like the loss of a job, the loss of health, a relationship that's just crumbling apart, even the loss of someone that we love. C.S. Lewis wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, and in The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, um, he has Lucy, who's a human, talking to Mr. Thomas, who's from Narnia. Mr. Thomas says to Lucy, well, you see, here in Narnia, it's always cold, it's always winter here, here in Narnia. And Lucy said, well, it's not all bad being winter all the time. You get Christmas during winter time, don't you? And with sadness in his eyes, Mr. Thomas says, no, not in Narnia. You see, here it's always winter, but it's never Christmas. I bet you it felt like winter for Joseph and Mary. Having to travel 70 plus miles by foot or by donkey with a very pregnant Mary. And for what? A census by the Roman government? Really? So that they could count their peons and tax them once more? Not a trip I would want to take. Amen? I'm sure for them it looked like winter. Dark, cold, without hope. Has anyone here experienced a time in their life where it feels like it's always winter, but never Christmas? The good news is that because of Bethlehem, we do have hope. Christ has come, our first as, as our Savior. He has come to save us from the brokenness of this cold and dark world. He's come to save us from the sinfulness from within. Max Lucado is the author of the book that inspired this series. And this is something he wrote after uh, acknowledging the fact that the earliest crosses were referred to as trees. This is what he wrote. Somewhere on the timeline between the tree of knowledge in the garden and the tree of life in heaven is the tree of sacrifice near Jerusalem. And if Christmas trees are known for beauty and gifts, then who would deny that the most wonderful Christmas tree was a rugged one on Calvary? On the cross, Jesus took on our sin. He was covered by the rebellion that separated us from God. 
He endured what we should have endured. He paid the price to save us. In the manger, God loves you through the cross. God saves you. How is it that Jesus is the greatest gift for humanity? In Jesus we find the Savior. One who saves us from the guilt of past sins. You see, because of Bethlehem, we know that the God who saves us chose to have his first bed be a food trough where animals eat. In other words, your life cannot get too dirty that will stop him coming from saving you from the guilt of your past sins. Not only that, he will heal us from the present brokenness within us that causes us to sin in the first place. And, and then finally, he will rescue us from pain and suffering and even death itself when he returns. You see, because of Bethlehem, we know that we have a God who has come here on a search and rescue mission. And he will return, and for those who trust in him, there will be no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. For death itself will die in Christ, in his saving power, he will make all things new. So how is it that Jesus is the greatest gift we have received? He is our Savior. He saves us from the guilt of past sins, present brokenness, and he will save us from the brokenness outside of us when he returns. But what is it that makes him the Savior? The second title that's given to Jesus is that he's the Messiah. This is the same Greek word that's also translated Christ. So the answer is no, Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's a little bit funny. But other than being Jesus' last name and saying the phrase Messiah complex, we don't use this word a lot, right? So what does this word mean and how does it help us to understand who Jesus is? The Greek word actually literally means the anointed one. In other words, it's an indication of the fact that Jesus is the one whom God has chosen. Now, now none of us like to be chosen last, right? We give flashbacks to gym class when we were in middle school. None of us like, like to be chosen last to go to parties, to receive gifts, to get special treatment, especially whenever we don't feel all that special. <clears throat> the shepherds didn't feel all that special. They were despised by society. They were rejected by a polite company. They were looked at with suspicion for most people. Has anyone here felt unspecial? I don't think I'm the only one. Max Lucado wrote another book. He's written many books, but one of them is a children's book. It's called You Are Special. And in this book, it's, it's about a group of wooden people. They're called Wemmicks. You see the Wemmicks, they put a gold star on someone if they thought they did something good, but they put a gray dot on someone if they thought they did something bad. The main character's name is Punchinello. And you see, Punchinello, he has a lot of gray dots. And one day, Puccinello meets another Wemmick that doesn't have any stars or dots on her. And he says, how can this be? And she said, you see, you have to go to our maker, the, the carpenter, Eli. So Puccinello goes to Eli's workshop, and this is part of his conversation with Eli. Eli says to Puccinello, what other Wemmicks think doesn't matter. All that matters is what I think, and I think you're pretty special. Puccinello laughed, he said, be wise. I can't walk fast, I can't jump, and my pain is feeling. Why do I matter to you? Eli looked at Puccinello and put his hands on those small wooden shoulders. And he spoke very slowly. Because you were mine. That's why you matter. Max writes that Eli reminds him of this one more time before Puccinello leaves. And as he leaves, one gray dot falls to the floor. Sometimes I feel like I'm covered in gray dots. Sometimes I feel like the shepherds, forgotten, despised, and rejected. But you see, because of Bethlehem, because of Bethlehem, we know that the anointed one, the chosen one of God, loves us. I mean, after all, he chose to invite dirty, smelly shepherds to his zeroth birthday party. He will also invite us into his life. Why? Because we can walk fast, because we can jump high, because our pain isn't feeling? No. Because we are his. And he loves us. So what is it about Jesus? 
the Messiah, the chosen one that makes him the greatest gift. Because of him, our lives, our second F, S, have significance, eternal significance. We've been given the greatest gift of significance in him. So why? Why is it that because in Christ, our lives have eternal significance, the last title that's given to Jesus by the angel is Lord. In this week, we find out that because of Bethlehem, the creator of the universe stepped into his creation. And why did he come? Well, by Jesus' own words, he came to seek and save those who were lost. Jesus came to forgive the sinner, heal the broken, and be a friend to the friendless. Jesus proudly wore the label, friend of sinners. In Jesus' day, the Jewish people knew that the world was broken and sinful around them. And, and they thought of it like pollution or a disease. The idea was this. If I touch something diseased, that disease will come and infect me. But an amazing thing happened because of Bethlehem. Because of Bethlehem, the Lord of the universe came down to earth. And when he touched something that was polluted, he did not become polluted. Instead, that which was broken became whole. <laughs> In other words, whenever Jesus hung out with sinners, whenever he touched someone with leprosy, whenever he spent time with those who were unclean, his holiness and his wholeness restored those whom he came into contact with. So what does this have to do with us? Max Locato notes that once we pick a Christmas tree, we're not done, right? We have to trim it, we have to decorate it, and then we have to put gifts under it. When the Messiah, when the Chosen One chooses us and we accept Him as Lord, He's not done with us. Instead, by the power of His Holy Spirit, His holiness and wholeness comes to us. And He prunes us. He prunes off all of those bad habits and dispositions that are keeping us from a loving relationship with Him. And then He decorates us. He decorates us with a transformed heart. Reflecting the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. And then finally, he gives us the greatest gift he could ever give. Look at the shepherds. When, when they have this experience, are they content just to keep it to themselves? No, instead we read that they go out in joy, they, they spread the word, they go tell it on the mountain, as we just heard. They tell everyone of this beautiful thing which would happen to him. Luke faithfully reports that they go glorifying God. Why is it that when Jesus is our Lord, our lives have eternal significance? Because when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord, he invites us onto our final S, the search and rescue mission that was started in Bethlehem those many years ago. He enables our lives to have eternal significance because we have the ability to share the gift with others. The gift that keeps on giving even more than a year-long subscription to the Jelly of Month Club. One that will never disappoint us. Because of Bethlehem, we received the gift of a Savior. One who saves us from the guilt of past sins, the present feeling of brokenness, and he will save us even from death itself in the future. Because of Bethlehem, our lives have eternal significance, not because of what anyone in the outside world says or thinks of us. Instead, as Max writes, you were created on purpose for a purpose. You have significance because you belong to God, and he loves you. A life of eternal significance. Because Jesus Christ is our Lord and He has invited us onto the greatest search and rescue mission ever undertaken. A search and rescue mission in which we are filled up with Christ's love and we have the amazing opportunity to share the greatest gift with all those around us. Please pray with me. Loving Father, send your Holy Spirit. Send your Holy Spirit so that we can receive the greatest gift ever given to us. The gift of your Son as our Messiah, as our Savior, and our Lord. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.